Good morning, everybody. Like Law said, uh, my name is John, and I work here at Calvary. Uh, a little bit about me. I have been married to my wife, Kaylee, for almost two years now, the queen bean. She's the best. Um, I coach football over at Churchill Child Eye for seventh and eighth graders. I love superhero movies, and I'm a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. I don't know how many of you guys watch the Discovery Channel, like Finding Bigfoot and UFO Hunters. Um, I don't adhere to those, but I have always believed that it, the Loch Ness Monster was at some point real. I don't know if it was prehistorically, uh, but I believe that at some point there was a monster that lived in Lake Loch Ness in Scotland. There's zero evidence to support my theory. Um, but to this point, I believe it anyways, and I have yet to uh, receive any significant backlash, aside from the weird looks that you guys are giving me right now. Um, but I do think that there are things that we believe that aren't true that play a significant role in our lives. And for me, there have been things that I believe, there have been lies that I've believed that have impacted my day-to-day -day life significantly. And those lies come from somewhere and it's not the Discovery Channel. Um, so this morning, we're gonna talk about Satan, who is the father of lies. His, the Bible says his native language uh, is lies. And my explicit goal for today is that coming out of this service, we could all have a better understanding of who he is, of how he tries to lie to us, and that we could be better prepared to defend against those lies when they come and step into the freedom that God bought for us when Jesus died on the cross. Amen? Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for an opportunity to be in your presence. I pray that you will be glorified in my speech, and I pray uh, that we would come away from this morning hearing the words that you want us to hear. In Jesus' name. So, like I said, I love superheroes. Uh, I'm a big origin story fan, um, and, and as a result of that, uh, I've watched pretty much every Marvel movie that you can watch five times or so. Uh, and the reason that I love origin stories is because they tell you why a hero or a villain uh, values the things that they value and why they do the things that they do. And all created beings have an origin story. We all start somewhere. And Satan is a created being. And so he has an origin story that's actually found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14. And it actually starts in heaven. And so the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, it says this. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. So Satan's story actually begins as an angel and his downfall is a result of a desire to be God. He was a creation who desired the role of creator and as a result, he's cast out of heaven and, and scripture describes him as the prince or the ruler or the small g God of this world that we are living in right now. And his mission is to lie and to steal and to kill and to destroy. And the big thing to take away about who Satan is, is that he is in every way opposed to and at war with God. He has a, a burning hatred for God and will therefore do anything that he can to hurt God. But God is all powerful. And so as a result, the most accessible way for Satan to hurt God is by hurting the people that God loves. And so he will do anything that he can to inhibit us from taking hold of the fullness of life that Jesus bought for us on the cross. And he's going to do this through two types of lies. Personal lies, which are lies that we believe about ourselves, and relational lies, which are lies that we believe about other people. And so we're going to take a look at each, but I actually want to start with the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, if you've heard someone talk about spiritual warfare before, this might have been the passage that they referenced but we're going to read it a little bit. Verses, verses 10 through 18 says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So I said before, um, we're going to talk about personal lies and relational lies. And personal lies, which are lies that we believe about ourselves, can actually be the most isolating lies that we believe because they don't just isolate us from other people. They will also allow us to isolate ourselves from God. That is what personal lies, uh, when we feel them, will do. When I was a kid, uh, I was probably in third or fourth grade, I went to a conference at my school where they brought in a youth pastor to speak, and I couldn't tell you what the actual message uh, was supposed to be about, but I can tell you the story that he told, which was about a child who had done everything that they could uh, to serve God and to please God and to do all the right things. And at this point in my life, I was nine years old. That was my goal, was to, to do the right things and to please God. Um, and then the rest of the story was that this kid grew up and followed God for pretty much their whole life. And then when they got to high school, they took a trip on spring break and they made one bad choice and they died. And that was, that was the end of the story. And, and, and I don't know what the point was supposed to be, but what I took away was, you know, either you, you choose Jesus or you choose death. And so for me, I was like, so I will do the right things as many times as I can. But if I do one wrong thing, I know what's coming. And so as a result of this, I, I started to feel this constant sense of fear of the wrath of God. And I started praying these prayers of repentance. And it got uh, out of hand in the sense that I was asking God for forgiveness for things like if I put my Bible on my nightstand and then I put another book on top of my Bible, I would pray a prayer of forgiveness asking God to forgive me for putting another book on top of my Bible on my nightstand. Or if I was reading a book, not even the Bible, if I was reading a book and I lost my place, I would pray and ask God to forgive me for losing my place while I was reading my book. And so what ended up happening was I was living, but I was living within the confines of this fear. And I really believed that this fear that I was living in was the only thing that was keeping me from experiencing the wrath of God. I believed that that fear was what was keeping me safe. And at the same time, I was becoming more and more inhibited and confined. And my relationships were suffering and my development was suffering. And I didn't even realize it. And I think sometimes we don't realize how inhibited we are by personal lies, lies that we believe about ourselves. But listen to these things and tell me if, if they might apply to something that you've experienced in the past or something that you might be experiencing right now. Do any of these resonate with you? I'm less than the people around me. I'm unlovable. I can have more power and more protection if I don't forgive other people. I can control the direction of my life better than God can. I should be able to satisfy every desire that I feel. If I just had this thing, I would be content. I am where I am because of all my hard work. My actions are justified if it gets me what I need. What I believe is true is more trustworthy than what God says. Being afraid is what keeps me from harm. I am entitled to everything that I have. Even God has abandoned me. So when we believe these things, we become subject to what's called a spiritual stronghold. These are things like pride and insecurity and lust and deceit and bitterness. And the reason that they're called strongholds is because once they have a grip on you, they don't let go. And so that was me. I was believing this lie that, that my fear was what, was what was keeping me alive. My fear was what was keeping me from danger. I was in this stronghold of fear. And so when we get to that point, how do we defend against those lies? And the first thing that I think is the most important defense that we have is to know who your hero is. 
I said before, I love superhero movies, and I'm so sorry about all the superhero analogies that are involved with this message, but I love superhero movies, and I love dramatic hero moments. There's always a moment at the end of the superhero movie where you thought they were down, and you thought the people that they were coming to rescue were for sure goners, and then they come back in in this awesome entry, and they do one of those drops from the ceilings and land and stand up, and the music cues, and it's just this awesome moment, and you know that regardless of how the odds are stacked against them, that hero will not lose. There's a specific scene from uh, Avengers Endgame. I'm not, I hope you guys all had a chance to watch it. It came out like two years ago, so I'm sorry if I'm spoiling it for you. But there's a scene from Avengers Endgame where Captain America walks into this whole army of evil aliens. I really sound like a nerd right now. Um, where he walks into this whole army of evil aliens, and it's just him against this whole army. And yet you know in that moment that there is no way that he is going to lose that battle. And I think what's so interesting about that is that we have a desire to be Captain America in that picture. I have a desire to be the one who can walk up against an army and know that I'm not going to fail. But in actuality, I could tell you in the last four days, I caught myself believing one of these lies. In the last four days, I caught myself thinking and acting on one of these lies. And if you thought back over the last week, you probably could too. We are not the rescuers, we are the rescued. Carrie said two weeks ago that the Bible is an entire library explaining how God relates to humans. The Bible is one giant rescue story. And it's the greatest rescue story of all time. And in the story of humanity and in our personal lives, Jesus is always the hero. And knowing God and knowing Jesus is the most important thing that you can ever do. It's the best thing that you can invest your time in. It's the best thing that you can invest your energy in. Knowing God, knowing who Jesus is, is the most important thing you can ever do. And every single one of these pieces of armor that is described in this Ephesians 6 passage is an aspect of who God is and what Jesus has done. Truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God is the author and creator of all truth. Righteousness. That the only way that we can be righteous is through what Jesus did on the cross. That is our righteousness. He is our righteousness. Peace, an unwavering peace comes from knowing that even though we will have trouble in the world, Jesus has already overcome this world. Faith, which is the confidence in what we hope for, that in the end, God will set all things right and we will spend eternity with him. Salvation, which is the greatest gift of all time, that Jesus took every mistake that we have ever made on himself and experienced the separation from God that we deserved so that we could spend eternity with God because of that sacrifice. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, an entire library devoted to God sharing his rescue story with us. Everything that protects us from the lies of Satan comes from knowing Jesus. It comes from knowing who he is. He is the one who takes away the sin of the world. It comes from knowing what he does. He is the one who delivers us from evil. And the more you know about Jesus, the more you will learn what he says about you. That regardless of what you've done or what's been done to you, you are loved with an everlasting love. And that regardless of what your earthly family has looked like, you are the child of a king. And not just a king, but the king of all eternity. Get to know Jesus and get to know what he says about you. It is the most important thing you can ever do. And so these weapons that, that describe these aspects of Jesus, they're not traditional weapons, things like truth and peace and salvation. They're actually things that are meant to be shared. And this is the second aspect of the defense that God gives us against Satan's lies is he gives us a whole army of people to fight with. Know your army. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So I kind of left off halfway through that story where I was buried in fear as a third or fourth grader. But my parents, who are two of my best friends still to this day, and they would remember this occasion very well, they refused to allow me to walk through that season by myself. And I have distinct memories of sitting on my parents' bed with my mom as she reoriented and prayed with me and shaped my perspective of Jesus that he was not waiting to smack me down when I made a mistake. He was waiting for me with open arms 
as a friend. And I remember sitting in the back seat of our car as my dad shared with me that there is no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. They reshaped, they prayed for me, they prayed with me, and they reshaped my view of who my hero was until one day I was able to step out of this stronghold of fear that I had been living in. For me, it felt like an eternity. It might have been a couple months, but I was nine, so you gotta give me, some, give me a break on that one. So it felt like, if I could describe the feeling to you, it felt like when you've been underwater for a long time and you come back up and you breathe for the first time after you've been holding your breath for so long and there's this exhilaration and almost a panic, but it's an excitement just to be alive. And that's what it felt like to step out of this stronghold. And so when we've wandered from the truth, God gives us each other to support through the, through the lies that we've experienced and to bring us back into an understanding of who he is. And in order for you to take steps towards freedom, you actually need that support. And so one of the most difficult and yet valuable truths is that public victories begin with private vulnerability. The thing that you've been struggling with, the thing that you've been keeping to yourself, the first step in healing and in freedom and in victory is to share that burden with someone who will pray for you, who will keep you accountable, who will share truth with you. And here's the thing, being vulnerable is so hard. Some people are really good at it. I suck at being vulnerable. I actually have someone in my life who keeps me accountable to being vulnerable. Once a month, I have someone in my life who, spe who, who has to keep me, he has to remind me to be vulnerable. Otherwise, I will not do it. And I'm not saying to share your personal struggles with everyone that you're in contact with, but who is someone in your life who loves you, who loves God, and who wants to see you step into the fullness of life that God has for you? If you've been walking in darkness by yourself, if you've been carrying this burden alone, it is your chance to step into community, to share that with them. There is a whole army of people. What you will find is that they want to go to war with you. If you have a rooted group, hear me right now, that is what those groups are for. We are there to carry each other's burdens, to support each other, to speak truth, to pray for each other. Who is someone in your life that you can share your burden with? And maybe right now you're watching online or you're here in person and you're thinking, I actually don't have that person. I've never even been to Calvary Assembly before and I don't know who you are. That's okay. I, I'm glad that you're here. And if, if you don't feel like you have someone in your life right now who is, loves God and who loves you and who wants to see you take that next step, I'm glad that you're here today because that's what church is for. And we want to be that for you. We have a whole pastoral team of people who love to listen and, and to process and to pray and to grow with you. And so if that's you and you don't feel like you have someone, we want to be that for you. And you can actually go to, uh, it's the letter R, rcalvary.org slash struggle, as in the struggle bus rcalvary.org slash struggle, and you can sign up to meet with any one of our pastoral team. You can actually choose who you want to meet with. I wouldn't meet with me, I guess, but, uh, but you could. You, you can meet with anyone you want on this pastoral team. We want to listen. We want to support you. We want to walk with you. So when we're attacked by these personal lives, we meet them by knowing who our hero is, by falling deeper in love with him, by knowing what he says about us, and by sharing our burdens with the people around us. And the second type of lies that Satan will use to try to attack us is relational lies, which are lies about other people. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 said, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And here's the thing, it's actually no surprise that Satan attacks our relationships because they're part of the defense against personal lies. So he's going to attack the defenses that we have in order to isolate us from each other. In the American Revolution, I'm not a big history buff, but in the American Revolution, it was the first time that the concept of guerrilla warfare was introduced. Up to that point, armies would take turns shooting at each other. In the American Revolution was the first time that people were hiding in bushes or behind trees. And the entire, the entire idea was to divide and to confuse the army that you were attacking. That's how Satan works. He's not going to come at you guns blazing from a mile away so that you have the opportunity to put your shield in the ground and load your gun. 
He loves to divide and to confuse us. And so he'll specialize in whispering these half-truths to make us believe, oh my gosh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. That seems legit. But he has a mission. And so you can always tell the lies of Satan when they come because he will make your enemy a human being. Satan will always make your enemy a human being. His biggest trick is to divide and to conquer. And there are glaring examples in, of this in our world right now. You know, racism is the belief that someone has less value because of the color of their skin. Ageism is the belief that someone has less value because of how long they've lived on this earth. But it doesn't start there. I think that's what we miss so often is that it actually starts with a whisper in the back of your head that says, that woman, I know who she's been with and I know where she's been. There's no reason for me to reach out to her. That guy only cares about girls, not worth my time. That preacher is all style and no substance and I bet he doesn't even love Jesus. That political candidate doesn't care about people, only cares about control. And anyone who supports them must support the same thing. That woman who ruined my life when she said that about me, I could never forgive her for that. And you know what each one of those statements has in common? Every time we allow one of those thoughts to linger in our mind, we take a step back from community. Every time. And it starts small. Satan doesn't come to us and, and, and say, hey, I want you to devalue that person. I want you to make that person your enemy. I want you to put them down. But he's going to gradually shift your focus with these little lies until your focus shifts from who your real enemy is to viewing a human being as your enemy, a human being who God loves, a human being who he sent Jesus to die for. I mean, we live right now in what's called cancel culture, where we specialize in valuing people based on their absolute worst mistakes and isolating them because of that. God's charge to us is the same in every situation. Love your enemies. Pray for the people who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. If you want to win the battle, you have to know who you're fighting against. You also have to know how to fight. Where are you balling your fists right now where you should be bending your knees? And so there's actually an exercise to reorient your heart towards who your real enemy is. This week or even today, pray for one person who up to this point you have viewed as an enemy. Pray for one person in your life who up to this point you have viewed as an enemy. This could be someone who has hurt you. It could be a, a political candidate or a celebrity. It doesn't have to be someone that you know personally. It could be a competitor in your job or someone that you've wanted to see fail so that you could succeed. It could just be someone that you've judged in the past. Well, pray for them and don't pray that they would see things the way that you see them. Pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray that God's will would be done in their lives, that he would provide for their needs, that he would lead them away from temptation and deliver them from evil. And then, and this will be the most challenging part, pray a supernatural blessing over your enemies. This is First Chronicles chapter four, says this, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Pray that your enemies would be blessed, that God would enlarge their territories, that his hand would be with them, that he would keep them from harm. And I did this in the process of preparing for this. And I will forewarn you, it is hor it's not a fun thing. It's not a fun thing to pray for the people that you've seen as your enemies. And every inclination will be for you to move towards being like, God, will you just allow them to see things how I see them? You might actually have to start praying it out of obedience. You might have to, your, 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 your heart, your mind might have to follow your words in this case. You might have to start praying this prayer purely out of obedience to what God has called us to. But over time, you will see your focus shift from your enemy being that person to your enemy being Satan and your love being for that person. 
And we have no better example of this than in the heart of Jesus, who, hanging on a cross, carrying the mistakes and the struggles and the sins of every single person who has ever lived in the presence of us as we were his enemies with his dying breaths, said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus is our only hope in the battle against Satan. The good news is that he's a pretty great hope to have. So when Satan spits these lies at our relationships, we meet them by loving our enemies, by praying for the people who hurt us the way that Jesus did when we were his enemies. I'm going to have the worship team come back out as we close here. So the question then becomes, why does any of this matter? There's a real enemy who desires your destruction. He operates and lies and he celebrates when we isolate ourselves from God and attack each other. But God has the ultimate victory, the ultimate authority over Satan in what Jesus did on the cross. It says that he triumphed over the powers and the principalities. And not just that, he made a public spectacle of them. And because Jesus made a public spectacle of the darkness then, God can and will use your life to make a public spectacle of the darkness now. Fall deeper in love with Jesus. Learn what he says about you. Share your burdens with each other. Love and pray for your enemies. Because at the name of Jesus, chains are still breaking every day. At the name of Jesus, chains are still breaking every day. He wants you to experience freedom in him. He wants you to share that with the world and he wants you to breathe again. Would you pray with me? Father, you have been so, so good to us. And sometimes it's hard for us to recognize how good you have been through the lies that we hear in our lives, whether they come from inside of us or whether, they, whether they're lies about the people outside of us. Would you restore our perspective of truth? Would you exchange the lies that we have felt for your truth, that you are good, that you do not fail us? that you made a public spectacle of the darkness and that you will do it again in our lives, God. I pray that blessing over every person in this room. Would you help us to know who you are? Would you help us to lean on each other for support? Would you help us to know freedom in you? In Jesus' name, would you stand with us in worship?